Good morning, good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us prepare our hearts for worship.
Good morning. Let's stand and worship God. Come and see the wonders of God. The sea became dry land, and the exiles were saved. Come and see the wonders of God. The works of the Lord's hands are truth and justice. Come and see the wonders of God. We worship the Lord, who sent redemption to the people and has ordained the Holy Covenant forever. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Give praise to our God, you people everywhere. Let the songs of our praise be heard. Say to God, how awesome are your actions. Before your love, all things are reconciled. Amen. Acknowledging that we have not always been faithful. 
It's not that we have had our doubts, but that we have failed to acknowledge your presence in our lives. We have been proud of our own accomplishments, frustrated when things don't go our way, and we've turned inwards instead of seeking your guidance. In your mercy, may we receive again your healing mercy and grant us courage to live for your glory. Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns for us. Christ intercedes for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. An old life has gone. A new life has begun. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Since God and Christ has forgiven us, let us also forgive one another. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Peace. 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 Welcome to Westminster. We're so happy to have you here worshiping with us on this beautiful Lord's Day. It's finally starting to be fall, which is very nice. I'm a big fan. Uh, we ask you to please join us in our ritual of friendship by signing and passing the friendship pads, which are located on the center aisle end of your pew. Uh, note the names of, the, of people you may not know yet, so after the service you can greet them and say hello. If you feel like Westminster is the place where you would like to live out your discipleship, we invite you at the close of worship to head over to the parlor, where a member will greet you and answer any questions you may have about the life and witness of Westminster. Today is the last Sunday to nominate church members to serve as elders and trustees. We invite you at the, uh, to nominate a church member, we invite you to complete a ballot form, which can be found in the parlor by a wooden ballot box. We thank you in advance for your submissions. We would love for you to join us in helping our wonderful Habitat for Humanity family, Ibrahim, Habsa, and their children, move into their new home to, with a stocked pantry. This makes for the second consecutive year that we are collecting non-perishable food items, and this year we are adding baby wipes and diapers for their new baby due in early November, too, which is very exciting. Uh, please keep in mind that there are dietary restrictions for the family, which include no pork and no pork products. You can stop by the Habitat uh, table in the parlor every Sunday until October 20th to fill our blue basket with your generous gifts of food and kitchen provisions. Thank you for your generosity. Um, immediately following this service, we will have our prayer service for wholeness in the chapel. 
So if you are in need of prayer, I encourage you to join us then. We'd love to have you. And at this time, I would like to invite up Lib Caldwell uh, for a moment for mission. When I moved here from Chicago in 2014, my husband, Harold Jackson, and I decided we would visit Presbyterian churches in Nashville as we looked for our church home. We came to Westminster first, since he had been active here before, but we never got around to visiting any other Presbyterian churches. <laughs> God's light shines in us in very different ways. For us, it began with this worshiping community, God's family of faith gathered here on Sunday. The music, the liturgy, the preaching, the sacraments, the friends on our pew, all those things we say and sing and do that remind us of God's love and Jesus' expectations for how we are to live. The Lord be with you. We say it often here, don't we? God is with us in this place and when we leave. I see God's light in the children and the youth that we sit with, and I give thanks for the many ways that their spiritual formation happens in church school, in youth groups, in choir, in camps. And I see God's love in the faithful adults who are their shepherds, their teachers, their choir directors, their parents and their grandparents. Another thing we hear in worship is, listen for the word of God, and we say, we open our ears to hear God's word, an old story that is always disturbingly new. God's light shines in us when our ears and our eyes are tuned to the many ways this church offers us opportunities to be connected with each other and in mission and service in Nashville and way beyond. Harold and I looked no further. We stayed here because in this community of faith, we are called and challenged to witness to our lives of faith. As we sang last Sunday, here the love of God is revealed through Jesus, revealed in time and space. As we share in Christ, the love that frees us, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. All of us, every child, every teenager, every adult, we are all called to be generous, generous with our love, our gifts, and our time. As together we do justice, we love kindness, and we walk humbly with God. I call your attention to the other announcements found in your bulletin. Thank you again for joining us for worship this morning. Let's continue to worship. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Prepare our hearts, O God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, 
that in hearing we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The first reading today comes from Jeremiah chapter 29. Hear the word of God. These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders among the exiles, and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not increase, or er, and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. The word of the Lord. gospel lesson is from the 17th chapter of Luke's gospel, verses 11 through 19. Hear the word of God. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him, keeping their distance. They They called out to him, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. This is the word of the Lord. Where are the other nine? Where are the other nine? Jesus says that as if there are strings attached. Are there strings attached? Jesus, you said, 
go show yourselves to the priest. That's what they did. They went to the authorities to show themselves, to get the thumbs up that they're clear. And you ask, where are the other nine? Well, they're showing themselves to the priests. They're embracing their families. They're embracing life again, celebrating. Were they supposed to return? You said go. They obeyed. Are you saying that there are strings attached? Is there small print behind every act of kindness and mercy? Is there always a debt of gratitude that must be paid? Like when you've done all your Christmas shopping, all of it, it's over with, you put the credit card away, let it cool off, and then a good friend comes by with a gift, a really great gift, a gift that is all about you, just says it all. Thank you for your, oh, it's just great. But in the back of your mind is saying, oh, great. We've had 25 years of friendship. We've never exchanged Christmas gifts, and now he's given me a gift? Fine. So you go on Google, and you Google, when you found out the cost of your gift was $225, and so you've got to figure out something that's going to be equal to that and express the same things about him. And so you go looking, and it's like, well, it's not quite $225, and so you throw in some coffee filters and some dark chocolate and, you know, other things. And Does every act of kindness and mercy have strings attached, some matching gift that's got to happen? Jesus asks, where are the other nine? Like there's strings attached. Like there's a bunch of thankless people out there. You know, every sermon needs some motivation, something to motivate it. I, I, this one, I, I could choose guilt. Guilt is a great motivator. Hey, dear congregation, how thankful have you been? Do you remember when you gave thanks to God yesterday? Or how about the day before yesterday? Or how about today? How are you doing with giving thanks to God? Guilt is a great motivator. Only one out of ten showed up for worship. That's how it is during fall break. During the Sunday after Thanksgiving, the Sunday after Christmas, MLK Sunday, spring break, summer, Where are the other nine? I could make that a sermon series for the whole year. <laughs> I could do a guilt-driven annual campaign, church budget campaign. Can you see me opening up a mailbag in the pulpit and pulling out the envelopes? So far, we've received pledge cards from Sally and Bill and George. Sally, Bill, and George, would you please stand up? Now, these are people who understand what it means to give God thanks, to live generously. These are great people. Now, George, I think you could have given a little bit more. I know where you live, but I'm grateful. And I'm wondering where the rest of you people are. I mean, there are pledge cards in the pews. Can, does it take forever to fill out your gratitude to the Lord Jesus Christ? We're not leaving this place until the pledge cards are filled. Does God's love require some debt of gratitude. Are there strings attached? We're not ten made clean. Where are the other nine? Is guilt the take home here? For God so wanted to guilt the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will need to make it up to him every day in some way. I hope that's not the message. I always pray that the message of the gospel is good news. That the gospel message is something of love. And love is a motivator that tugs at the heartstrings. I love my family very much. I don't know if that was ever an intellectual ascent. 
I think about my family, I worry about my family, I enjoy my family. And if there is any deep pain with my family, it comes from love. I suppose I love because my parents first loved me and then I love them right back. My father died years ago. I'm still connected with that love. I still cry. I still have the heartstrings. And I'm thankful to have it. And my prayer for all of you is that you have heartstrings as well. Someone tugging at your life. The theology of the church says that God has heartstrings for the whole creation. The theology of the church says that we have to seek out the depth and the richness of God's love. And so we have to love what God loves and who God loves. So we must love our neighbor. There's, there's these strings attached, it seems. But they're heart strings. They're wonderful strings. In our text this morning, we find Jesus on the way to Jerusalem. On the way to Jerusalem. There's strings attached to that. It's not that Jesus was on the way from point A to point B, Jerusalem, there, here I am. No, it's about being on the way. And the people of the early church were called people of the way. The way to Jerusalem is a a journey of a cross, and you carry it over the landscape of your life. The cross, the cross influences our moment to moment. At any moment, we can be kind or not. We can be grace-filled or not. We can be generous or not. We can be forgiving or not. We can be merciful or not. We can be loving or not. And if we choose the not, then we don't sound or look or feel like Jesus. He's traveling through the region between Samaria and Galilee. Those are strings attached there. They have some strings attached. It's like Jesus is walking between the lands of Turkey and Syria. Between the U.S. and Mexico. Between your fox and friend's spouse and your liberal sister at the Thanksgiving table between black and white, between two sides, bringing God's love, God's justice, God's word to that place of friction. We tend to avoid such places. We tend to pick a side and enlist as snipers sharpshooting our opinions from behind some phone screen to post on Twitter or Facebook, firing off a well-aimed comment at a TV screen, picking people off from bully pulpits, words, 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 just sent out, no strings attached. There used to be strings attached. I remember the story of John Rich, (laughs) who's a member of this church. I did his funeral a number of years back. I did his funeral, and most of the stories about John Rich I couldn't tell in church, if you understand. (laughs) One of the stories I love about John Rich is that he was driving in traffic. Leo Moore, who died recently, was a passenger in the car, and some guy cut him off, and John rolled down his window and yelled some, what do you think you are, you blankety-blank, you know, blankety-blank, something I can't tell in church. Well, the car pulled up to a stoplight, and John was right behind it, and the guy got out of the car, and he was big, and came up to John Rich's window and said, what did you call me? 
And John said, well, I called you a blankety blank, but now seeing the size that you are, I, I didn't really mean it. <laughs> <laughs> and that, my friends, is the difference between then and now. We no longer see each other eye to eye. We engage like snipers with no feeling. Nothing's there to keep our mouth shut. Enter into a conversation with someone from the other side, stand eye to eye, hear what they have to hear, see, say, and you talk of what you need to say, and you might change your words a little bit. You might find some place where you can speak with kindness and understanding. There's nothing now that keeps our mouths shut. And we don't have to listen to anyone from the other side. We do not engage anymore. Even when we march, we march with people who look like us and sound like us and talk like us, and we don't engage the other side. The last march that I took part in, I took part in and I was given a coupon to Starbucks while I was marching. And after the march, I took it up on the coupon, 20% off on a, a drink. And sure enough, that iced tea tastes really good after a long march. That's different than a letter from a Birmingham jail, right? That's different than being on a bridge. It's different when you engage between the sides. Dear right wing, dear left wing, who among us dares to feel the friction of trying to reconcile with this world? But this is the way of Jesus, navigating a world full of sides encountering lepers who stand at a distance, people with strings attached, by all costs they should be avoided. And that props up every once in a while in our country. Ryan White, remember him? That poor boy got AIDS through a blood transfusion before anybody could understand AIDS in the community of Kokomo, Indiana. Just, his mother said, people were really cruel. People said that he had done something bad or wrong. It was God's punishment. We heard that a lot. It was God's punishment. We can be kind or not. We can be healing or not. We can be grace-filled or not. We can be generous or not. We can be loving or not. Who are we? Go show yourselves to the priests. And they do. And then there's one who comes back, <laughs> who gives thanks in surprise. It's a Samaritan. You cannot write this stuff up better than this. <laughs> it's a Samaritan. You know who a Samaritan is? A Samaritan is someone who worships differently than you do. Your Samaritan may be a Trump loyalist. Or it may be someone who feels the burn. Imagine them showing up, prostrating themselves at the feet of Jesus. Oh, seriously? They got worship right? That political imbecile got worship right? Jesus, lay hands on him one more time. That's all I'm asking, one more time. Heal that person, please. There's nothing as irritating as someone who worships differently than you. You ever have a roommate in college? You ever have a roommate now? My roommate in college worshiped differently than I do, did. He spit his toothpaste out on the sink faucet. Who does this? He 
He went to bed at 10 o'clock in college. I worship the late night. He worshiped going to bed early. I worshiped a clean bedroom. He threw his clothes everywhere. He'd eat, and magically the dishes got washed. I'm doing all the work here. You're doing nothing. I would think about my roommate. It would consume my mind day and night. He was my Samaritan. Some of you may be married to Samaritans. I don't know. We know our Samaritans. Who are your Samaritans? They are the ones who worship differently. Here we are in worship. I guarantee you that if we had to spend a day or two days in worship, maybe just a day, after a while, even though we are worshiping the same, we'd we'd probably find some Samaritans in our group, right? Someone who would drive us absolutely bonkers because they worship something differently than we do. They point out their phones, watching the game. We're in worship. Samaritans are everywhere. Where two or more are gathered, there's bound to be a Samaritan messing up the whole thing. And it's the Samaritan who shows up and worships Jesus. When Jesus said to that Samaritan, go on your way, your faith has made you well. Do you think he went on his way? Or if somewhere on the way, he encountered someone on the side of a road. And instead of going his way, he set his face towards Jerusalem and chose to be kind, chose to be generous, chose to be loving, chose to be healing, chose to be merciful. No strings attached, except heartstrings. Heartstrings we call the love of God. And all God's people said, amen. At this time, I would like to invite the children forward to come celebrate Margaret's baptism.
hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Obeying the word of our Lord Jesus and confident of his promise, we baptize those whom God has called. In baptism, God claims us, He seals us, to show that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death, uniting us in Jesus Christ, in His death and resurrection. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of the On behalf of the session, I present Margaret Elsie, the daughter of Mary Margaret and David Wicker, to receive the sacrament of baptism. David and Mary Margaret, relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian faith and to teach that faith to your child? Do you? Yes. Wonderful. Do you, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and nurture this child by word and deed, with love and prayer, encouraging them to know and follow Christ and to be faithful members of his church? Do you? We do. And y'all down here, do you promise to love this baby, be your friend, and tell her about Jesus? If you do, please say yes really loud. Yes! Nice. Very loud. I love it. Uh, through baptism, we enter the covenant God has established. Within this covenant, God gives us new life, guards us from evil, and nurtures us in love. In embracing that covenant, we choose whom we will serve by turning from evil and turning to Jesus Christ. As God embraces you within the covenant, I ask you to reject sin, to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, and to confess the faith of the church, the faith in which we baptize. So, trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? Do you? Yes. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? Do you? Yes. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? Will you with God's help? Yes. With the whole church, let us confess our faith. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died in the tomb. believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of Christ. Amen. You may be seated. The Lord be with you. Give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We give you thanks, eternal God, for you nourish and sustain all living things. By the gift of water in the beginning of time, your spirit moved over the watery chaos, calling forth order and life. In the time of Noah, you destroyed evil by the waters of the flood, giving righteousness a new beginning. You led Israel out of slavery through the waters of the sea into the freedom of the promised land. In the waters of the Jordan, Jesus was baptized by John and anointed with, the spirit, with your spirit. And by the baptism of his own death and resurrection, Christ set us free from sin and death and opened the way to eternal life. We thank you, O God, for the water of baptism. In it we are buried with Christ in his death. From it we are raised to share in his resurrection. Through it we are reborn by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Send your spirit to move over this water, that it may be a fountain of deliverance and rebirth. Wash away the sin of all who are cleansed by it. Raise them to life. Graft them to the body of Christ. Pour out your Holy Spirit, so that this little one may have the power to do your will and continue forever in the risen life of Christ. You be all praise, honor, and glory through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> what is the name of this chat? Margot. Margaret Elsie. <laughs> Margaret Elsie. Child of the Covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father. Son, and the Holy Spirit. May the blessings of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend upon you, Margaret Elsie, now and forevermore. Margaret Elsie, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit and march as Christ's own forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> We've got a preacher on our hands, I think. <laughs> Oh, what am I supposed to say? Sorry. <laughs> With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome this little one into the body of Christ. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. As God's people call to love one another, let us pray for the needs of the church, the whole human family, and the world. When I say we pray to you, O God, I invite you, the congregation, to respond with, hear our prayer. Let us pray. That churches of all traditions may discover their unity in Christ and exercise their gifts in service of all. We pray to you, O oh God. Hear our prayer. 
that the earth may be freed from war, famine, and disease, and the air, soil, and waters cleansed of poison. We pray to you, O God, that those who govern and maintain, to maintain peace in every land may exercise their powers in obedience to your commands. We pray to you, O God, that you will strengthen this nation to pursue just priorities so that the races may be reconciled, the young educated, the old cared for, the hungry filled, the homeless housed, and the sick comforted and healed. We pray to you, O God, hear our prayer, that you will preserve all who live and work in our city in peace and in safety. We pray to you, O God, that you will comfort and empower people who face any difficulty or trial, people who are sick, people with little or no money, people who are oppressed, people who grieve, and people who are in prison. We pray to you, O God, hear our prayer. That you will accept our thanksgiving for all faithful servants of Christ now at rest, who with us await a new heaven and a new earth, your everlasting kingdom. We pray to you, O God. Yeah. Merciful God, as a potter fashions a vessel from humble clay, you form us into a new creation. Shape us day by day through the cross of Christ your Son, until we pray as continually as we breathe, and all our acts are prayer. Through Jesus Christ, and in the mystery of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Do good and share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God.
God who gives life to all things and richly provides us with everything, may we reflect your generous love and show the riches of your grace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thank you.